welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at news, topics, and events that are going on in your world today. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, an online academic community for all of you who are interested and active in the field of depth and Jungian psychologies, that is, psychologies that are based on the work of Carl Jung. And I am here today with Ernest and Catherine Rossi, and this is going to be a pretty exciting show for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is the first time that Depth Insights has gone live on video. So here we are. We're also going to delve into the neuroscience of creating consciousness, among other things. So uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you guys. Thanks for being here with me. Well, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Well, let me just tell you a little bit about Ernest and Catherine so that all of you who are watching and listening can have a bit of a, a feel for who they are and what their background is if you don't know them already. First of all, Ernest Rossi is a diplomat in clinical psychology and he's the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Field of Psychotherapy um, by actually three different organizations. One, the Milton H. Erickson Foundation in 1980 the American Association of Psychotherapy in 2003, and then the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis in 2008. And Ernest is a Jungian analyst, the science editor of Psychological Perspectives, and he's the author of 36 professional books and more than 170 published scientific papers in the areas of neuroscience, psychotherapy, dreams, and therapeutic hypnosis. And that's amazing, Ernest. I just can't believe that you've done that kind of work. It's, you've had a pretty full life. The amazing thing is, for me, my curiosity has taken me this many books and papers to try to answer the questions that come to me. To let you know, actually, Ernest's most recent book uh, is The Breakout Heuristic, and that was published in 2007. And you have a new one that's currently in press called Creating Consciousness. Yes, uh, and it should be out um, probably in late March, early April. Well, let's talk about you, Catherine, because you are, uh, you are giving Ernest a run for his money here. Catherine Rossi is the founding director of the Milton H. Erickson Institute of the California Central Coast, and she has edited, authored, and co-authored more than 15 books and 25 scientific articles. Not bad. Kind of amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. I guess I'm curious too. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> you guys seem like a good match for each other. So Catherine is a professor at the Neuroscience Institute for Psychotherapists of San Lorenzo Maggiore in Italy and also the Chief Financial Officer and Vice President for the Ernest Lawrence Rossi Nonprofit Foundation for Psychosocial Genomics Research. And she's a board member for the Erickson Foundation Archives and Press and an advising board member for the Simonton Cancer Center. And Catherine, you're also a psychologist in private practice in California, in Los Osos specifically. You're a certified yoga teacher and you've spoken at major conferences, universities, and teaching hospitals, including UCLA and the University of Salerno in Italy, on such topics as experiential psychotherapy, yoga and psychotherapy, the psychosocial genomics healing experience, mind, brain, body healing, hypnosis, brief therapy, and sex and couples therapy. And uh, I know that, Ernest, you also share a lot of those same topics. And you guys were just telling me before we started this that you have been doing a lot of Skype conferences lately where you are appearing literally in France, Brazil, all over the world by video and speaking to hundreds and, uh, and ultimately thousands of people in this way. And I'm so happy to see that you have really embraced this technology. I know um, in my own research I've discovered that a lot, there, there seems to be a, a gap not just with the psychology community and technology. A lot of communities have been um, resistant on some level to embracing technology, but I find that particularly psychology and depth psychology, we, we are so inclined toward the soul and wanting to be in a space that's uh, rather different and sometimes it's intimidating to see technology which tends to move at such a rapid pace and be quite complex on a number of levels and uh, so that's a particular area of interest with mine and I'm very happy to see people in the field of psychology who are adopting this at the rate and the the extent to which you both are so congratulations on that oh well thank you we have a lot of secrets of how to do this successfully <laughs> to share all of our secrets. Oh, yes. Because that's a very important word in our society. It's an important word in psychotherapy. 
we believe we're developing a new way of people to be private in public, for people to be able to undergo a real inner creative experience and at the same time know where they are in their experience to watch themselves and when they've gone through what we call the four stage creative process to come out and share with us with the audience the international audience if need be just what's appropriate to be shared about their experience you see, we're developing a new culture, a new way of sharing, and that's part of what we mean by creating consciousness. Absolutely, and that's the perfect lead-in, I think, to something that I'd like to ask you about, actually. You know, consciousness is kind of a buzzword these days, and, and it's becoming a bigger issue, uh, and more. there's more attention to it, I think, recently than there has been in, in past years. Part of that is because there's a lot going on in the world, and maybe there's the same amount going on that there always has been, and it's just that we're more aware of it because of these kinds of technologies that you're referring to, because of news and media. But, you know, I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about our own consciousness, each of us individually, and how we daily and even hourly create our own consciousness. Yes, well, this is a principle that goes all the way back to Charles Darwin. You know, Charles Darwin wrote this book 150 years ago, The Origin of Species. And people think that evolution takes place over millions of years. And that's very true. But Darwin actually said, but no, evolution takes place on a daily and hourly basis. And this was an amazing statement because there was no evidence for it at that time. Darwin didn't even know about genes. But since that time, we know that our genes are not just units of heredity that go from one generation to another, but daily and hourly, different patterns of genes express themselves to make the proteins, the hormones, the neurotransmitters that govern our mood and our consciousness. This is what we're trying to tap into, how people can become aware of what's being created in me right now in my consciousness that's new and I've never experienced before. You see how profoundly different this is from the usual psychoanalytic cognitive behavioral paradigm of analyzing the patient. We don't analyze people. We don't presume to interpret people. We've created methods whereby people can share what's going on creatively here and now, and even more important, how they can say that in public in a way where they retain their dignity, where they retain their self-respect, and the audience can say, oh, that's how they're experiencing the world at this time, at this moment. Mm -hmm. So you might say, this just occurred to me this morning, is this a new way of looking at Facebook and Twitter and the new media? It's immediate. Yes, that's what we've been working for with me over 40 years. How to express your ongoing experience. How do you tune into experience and watch yourself experience so you can wrap it up and share it with people around you in an appropriate way. But this is, in fact, when when you ask the question about, uh, you know, how how do you grow consciousness or how does consciousness happen? That it's it's literally the molecules that are dancing around in your brain, the way that your genes choose to express themselves in that particular moment. And how many, it's like an astro astronomical figure of um, how many ways that genes can express themselves in any given moment in it's time. Like there's a higher number than there are stars in the universe, mm -hmm. there are molecules in the universe. That are in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And more than the stars in the sky. Mm -hmm. And who could 
who outside of you in your own mind can say, oh, this is what's going on with you, and what you've got to do is this and so. What presumption. Who is able to read a mind that's a moving target, millions of billions of interactions? So from a professional point of view, we see all the previous therapies as kind of naive, presuming that one person can really interpret someone else well, where's your evidence for that? Yeah. Out of this, the person's consciousness is the most sensitive detector of what's going on in them. And the best anyone can do is share, oh, this is what I think about, this is what I feel about, this is what I'm going through right now. And just share that openly and transparently and know that no one's going to put a diagnostic label on it. No one's going to try to manipulate and turn that thing around to a way of changing their behavior. Every person becomes their own guru, I'd say. They learn on the fly, moment by moment, how to guide themselves. Self-guidance and self-care is the core of our approach. Mm. Thank you for that. And... Um... What you're saying is very powerful, and it's having a profound effect on me, I think, as I listen to you uh, on, a, on a couple of levels. First of all, when you, uh, a minute ago, when you were drawing attention to a person's sort of present moment consciousness and what's happening with, with a person at that moment in time, that really allowed me to tune in to my own way of being in the world at this moment, how my own genes are expressing at that very moment, in a, in a level of awareness that I am not used to living my life right. minute by minute on. So there's so much about the, the awareness of the awareness on, on some level that's important. Yes, the metal levels. Mm -hmm. And this is what we call communication by our mirror neurons reflecting each other. Mm. This has been a new concept that just came out in the past decade or so. We have mirror neurons that automatically pick up what's going on in another person's mind, and we, our mind starts to imitate what's going on. If you're feeling sad, there's some part of my mind that turns sad, and that's the basis of my empathy, my being sensitive and essentially compassionate with your states. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, why I'm saying wave one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah in human relationships rather than power and manipulation and that kind of, that politics of dominance, authority. We're trying to get beyond that to the genuineness of a person's inner experience. Which is like this almost like the soul level. That you know, as um, as we're looking at you, Bonnie, and you're looking at us, I feel this alive compassion that you know here you are so curious and I'm wondering about the people that choose to listen and to watch this um, video will they feel it too will they feel that the that zest for for life that curiosity of what does it mean and how can I be more conscious on a um, daily and hourly and even minute-wise basis, how often can I tune in? And where can I find people that believe that that's a good thing? Mm -hmm. I, suspect you're, I suspect there will be many who do tune into this, who are, who, for them, that is something that's sparked for them. And um, mm -hmm. I think that the other thing that you alluded to, Ernest, especially, uh, was that it's important to be able to articulate then the awareness and the feelings in a way that, uh, you know, so many of us in, in this culture particularly, it, it's not really set up to be non-judgmental. You know, there's, a, there's an expectation that we are going to be judged for a lot of what we perceive as our shortcomings and indeed are much more, I, I believe, about our challenges that we are here in life to to be able to work on and overcome. But that's one thing that I wanted to mention, uh, I guess, sooner in our engagement here rather than later, and that is that you are going to be doing a workshop uh, which is presented, hosted and presented by the Institute for Cultural Change. Yes, and a marvelous institute. That's coming up right away. They are a marvelous institute, and we have a wonderful relationship with Lori Pye, who is the director and founder there as well as you do. Uh, it will be... Um 
uh, on the 18th through the 20th of March and uh, in Los Osos, California. And it's uh, going to be marvelous. Wonderful. And I know that in, in that particular event, well, the, the official title, let's say first, the official title is How We Change the Brain to Change the Culture, Facilitating Creative Consciousness with Art, Beauty, and Truth in Psychotherapy. Yeah. And so many of the things I've heard you talk about just now are ways in which we can, first of all, increase our consciousness as individuals, and second of all, articulate what that shift is. Would you like to share a little bit more about what you foresee that process being there? Yes. Let me put it in the context of the fourth stage creative process. Every day, every hour and a half, we go through a complete cycle of where our energy comes up and there's an issue. There's, in fact, stage one is a problem. And the everyday housewife might say, hey, if I have to wash the dishes first, or I'm going to do the vacuum, or am I going to do the shopping? A problem comes up. Stage two, oh, okay, now you have to think through the logistics, and you frown, and sometimes there's difficulty integrating how are you going to solve this problem? And it's the same thing for a mathematician or an artist or a musician. They're going to play a new piece. Yes, how do they get to the difficult parts? Then if all goes well, and that stage too, by the way, is a place where a lot of people experience the so-called negative emotions, the tensions, the stresses, because their mind-body wants to move on to stage three. Stage three is the aha. Oh, that's what I can do. I have like a new problem, a unique situation. I can deal with it in this way. Ah, and now comes stage four. What do I do in my practical everyday life to actually put this new stage three insight into effect? And this is where a very important part of our process becomes evident. How do you say to someone else what you just went through? Maybe in stage two, you actually shed a few tears, or you became anxious. How do you say, yeah, at one point I was having difficulty with this, and yet suddenly I got that idea, and now I realize I can do such and such. Usually people, if it's a small group, want to clap hands. My God, she went through that whole process in two or three minutes. That's the ideal. Unfortunately, in everyday life, the problem with humanity in general is often we get stuck in stage two. We don't know how to get to stage three, and that's where we have many ways of facilitating people, what I call implicit processing heuristics. So it's, it's the stage two is when um, there's like a continuing iteration, you know, when you when you have a problem or a difficulty and you never seem to come out of it. And this is why lots, lots of people come for therapy, is they want to break out right. of, of this old, you know, uh, way of being. And that's why I called the first collection of my collection papers, the breakout heuristic, how to break out of that futile cycle into a new insight, and then develop the courage to plan how to implement it, and the psychosocial smarts of how do I express my experience to others so they understand that I'm working constructively within myself and with them rather than be threatened by any change that might be I have to carry out because of this new level of consciousness. Right. So there's specific stages, there's specific mm -hmm. techniques and there's a specific new, each time you go around the cycle, you get a new layer of consciousness, a new perspective. And that, of course, is what we need on an individual level, daily and hourly, and on an international level. What's happening on the international scene? We're solving fantastic pro problems, cultural problems where people have been suppressed for generations, and they're saying we can't take it anymore, and they're trying to break out Sometimes they have to break out violently, hopefully not so violently that they destroy their own culture. In psychotherapy, we have safer ways of breaking out. And in a way, it's safe because the 
person breaking out, having the living experience, is in control of the process. It's not some doctor out there telling you or some machine reading what's on your mind. There's no such legitimate devices. Each of us individuals, we have to respect ourselves. Only we have the highest level of insight within ourselves, and only we can express it to get help, to share it with our community. And so that's where stage four comes in. How do you share your situation so others can see sympathetically, compassionately, and you can bond together? And now that psychosocial bonding extends, it breaks people out of loneliness. Mm -hmm. It actually leads to life extension. It actually is healing us on many levels of trauma that were encoded in the state two and we never got rid of them. That's beautiful. Wow. <laughs> that's really beautiful. I, I, um, I can see that that's really, truly an example of what you're saying of facilitating creative consciousness. Now, uh, exactly. coming back to the workshop, the, the title of the workshop, Facilitating Creative Consciousness with Art, Beauty, and Truth in Psychotherapy. <laughs> so how yes. do those things, um, I, I mean, you've st you just started going there, so maybe I'm jumping the gun, but how do art, art beauty, and truth promote gene expression and brain growth then? So glad you asked. <laughs> Most people are very surprised to realize that when they're in a sense of wonder, they love this piece of music or this dance or this piece of art, that state of wonder is what Jung called, and he knows from, from a new neuroscience perspective, that's when the genes are turned on and you're giving full attention to that beautiful, artistic, or profound truth. You hear or think, and you know, wow, that's the truth. That's exciting to your system. Mm -hmm. That activity turns on the genes, takes the proteins to make the new neurons, the new networks that actually grows your brain so that new levels of consciousness emerge. So we're really recreating our brains when we have a true experience of art, beauty, and truth. It's not just an art, beautiful thing, or isn't that nice? No true artist would agree with that, you know, commonsensical point of view. They would always say, no, I worked on this for a long time, and there's a lot of myself that went into this. So we were listening to a biography of uh, Glenn Gould, the virtuoso musician called a genius. He has new interpretations of Bach and so forth. Yes, he learned to go into himself and we experience Bach so that when he plays for an audience, they get a new insight into Bach who lived thousands, you know, hundreds of years ago. So this is how art, beauty, and truth communicate to create a process over hundreds of years so that Yes, we're evolving better levels of consciousness, and these new levels of consciousness are actually causing our brain to grow. The brain has to grow to create the basis, the infrastructure for a new level of consciousness. That's what we're doing and, al today. and also, it's a good time to bring up um, what happens with the hippocampus. That, um, that what? The hippocampus. <laughs> okay. Wait, is that a zoo in, animal? <laughs> in ancient times, you know, you looked at the uh, the seahorses in the um, in the antiquities uh, around Rome and whatnot, and they have like fish tails, and then they've got the horse body, and they were called the hippocampuses. Hmm. And um, I mean, there'd be gorgeous fountains all over Italy that have uh, have these these sculptures in them. But the hippocampus that's in your brain almost looks like that. You know, it looks like a seahorse. And, uh, you know, I'm pointing because it's kind of sort of right, right in, inside here in your brain. And it's, um, it's where a, a lot of the elements of today are uh, dancing around. And so if you experience something numinous that is, is just makes you go into wonder, it makes you go into fascination today, then tonight when you go to sleep, 
your hippocampus is going to say, I learned something new today. I had something fantastic happen. And in your dreams, it literally, that's when the upload into your cortex, all around your brain, where it matters, it, uh, it begins to upload the new experiences, which makes the cascades of um, the molecular processes to make new uh, neural connections, to maybe birth new baby neurons that will then go on and to make sense of this new consciousness in the world. But if you don't have the experiences that we like to call art, beauty, and truth, you know, that, that, that the truth of the first time that you hear your baby laugh, you know, I mean, that's an experience that one never forgets, or a sunset that goes beyond recognition. It is just so gorgeous. Or the fact that you, you find that, that the, the sense of compassion you have for another is, is, is front row center. Or with me, sometimes when I'm doing yoga or teaching mm -hmm. yoga, if it's just a really breakout into a whole different kind of world. That's what stimulates today to go on to create more consciousness through the hippocampus and, uh, and, and dreams and um, just what your brain wants to do. Your brain wants to grow. Right, right. So what you're saying essentially is that consciousness begets consciousness in that sense. So that the yes. more you're able to experience and recognize a numinous experience, and of course Carl Jung spoke a lot about that and, and I think had a, a similar theory, um, the more that you in, actually engender more consciousness within yourself. And now I've heard you guys talk about the the novelty numinosum neurogenesis effect. Is that what is that what that is that you just described? Yes, it is the no, the novelty uh, numinosum neurogenesis effect. The novel experience is something new turns on your special attention, of fascination, interest, the tremendum. A lot of people associate this with the spiritual consciousness, but this numinous. Consciousness is actually turning on genes to create new baby neurons that will be the birth of new consciousness. Mm -hmm. So the novelty, numinosum, neurogenesis effect. How our life experience that is artful, beautiful, true, actually turns on genes and leads to brain growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, this isn't your old ABCs. This is a whole new view of human consciousness and culture and human relationships. What's a good relationship? One where we use our mirror neurons to bounce off each other, share our highest and best levels of consciousness. Think of what the alternative is. Most of, a lot of the dreamers you see on TV and movies, they emphasize the tragic. They emphasize being stuck in state two, battling the warriors, the fighters, the killers. That's a tragedy. We're emphasizing the middle stage of any creative That's new stage development. Stage two. Yes, yeah, stage two. And we stay stuck and we say we're wonderful. We can fight in stage two. Yeah, that's okay for a little while. But don't forget, you're really trying to get to stage three, a new insight. And to stage four, a new way of relating, understanding, and sharing, and and being, being. And in the the correlate of the neuroscience world, talks about novelty, enrichment, and exercise. And this is the these are the change agents to grow your brain in the new thinking of neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So you can see the immediate parallels. Absolutely. to uh, the novelty numinosum neurogenesis effect, to novelty enrichment and exercise. Now, exercise is both physical and mental, that the kinds of work that we do, the individual is really engaged with themselves, you see. That's their exercise. And um, this is where the burden of psychotherapy is within the individual. It's not that, that um, Ernest or I are telling anybody what to do. Our job is to be a facilitator so that you can go to the inside of yourself and that you can go through the four-stage creative process in your own unique way, in your own unique time. 
Yeah, that's very interesting. I, uh, I'm thinking while you're saying that about, you know, in depth psychology, a lot of the Jungian belief and uh, even Freud to some extent believe that between the psychotherapist and the client, there is a field that occurs and within that field is is where the healing and the the learning and the insight take place and and I suspect you know I don't know if he ever called it consciousness maybe he did but uh, I suspect that the consciousness is what is the field that he's referring to in that case that which is where that kind of um, really transformation can take place yeah there's many theories about fields about energy but our focus is on, is the client, is the patient, is the subject really in the driver's seat, recognizing what's important to them and how do we facilitate them going through the difficult transformations they have to go through mm -hmm. to become who they are. So there's many drugs, there's many electronic measuring devices, but none has yet given a purely objective view of the creative process on the highest levels of awareness. That's why we do all these new approaches that help a person tune into their highest level of awareness, and that's what they're to be exploring rather than what advice we might give them. So the locus of healing is shifted from the therapist, you know, the medical model. Yes, the therapist, a surgeon really is doing the healing, so to speak. In the psychological model, you give the power to the client. The surgery, so to speak, is their own consciousness. It's more sensitive than any device. It's more sensitive to any guru any leader who might presume to try to help them. How do we help the client develop that highest level of consciousness for their own self-guidance and self-care? That's mm -hmm. where we feel yes. is our, great, our highest mission. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, um, I, I can just see the power in all of this. I'm, I'm grateful for that. I, I'm wondering then if you could um, just for the benefit, maybe, for our listeners and viewers, in just 60 seconds, maybe, uh, give your definition of what is the new neuroscience of therapeutic hypnosis and psych psychotherapy. I mean, this is what we're talking about, and I, I get that. But maybe just in 60 seconds, can you just give us the sound bite? <laughs> it's the new therapeutic hypnosis and psychotherapy is almost the opposite of the popular conception. The popular conception in movies and TV programs is there's a patient who is, oh, is having such difficulty, and there's this wonderful therapist and guru who has all the answers and gives compassion to the patient, and after listening to them, hands down the answer. And the patient's, oh, so thankful. And, you know, I started out using that model. I was a pretty good Freudian analyst. I was a pretty good union analyst. Even patients laying in the couch would look up at me and say, Yes, doctor, you're right. Thank you. And I thought I was a wonderful person, and I ran to the bank happily with my fees. <laughs> but it was only gradually. Now I've been a therapist for 40 years. My big insight is, hey, it's not my words. My words often oh, can help. But how do I get the client to find their highest level of consciousness to create their own words for self-care? That's an even higher mission than the conventional view. So we turn things upside down, we like to believe, but always for the benefit of the client. They are in the driver's seat no one can be a guru better than you can be for yourself and your best mind, so to speak. Catherine and I find our best mind often in our dreams. We yeah. share our dreams every morning. Yeah. And I, I had a wonderful, incredible dream recently. I, I had a visitors in my mind and they were wondering if I understood something such about Catherine. And 
who were these visitors? What do they represent? You know, the uh, survey say the, uh, the American public more than 50% believe in angels. But uh, of course, we're not the real angels, but claims we see people as angels. Well, I think those strangers in my dream were like angels. They were missionaries from uh, my higher consciousness saying, are you realize, do you realize something's really creative going on in your life? And are you prepared to help her? Mm -hmm. And support her. Oh. Yeah, you have a mission I, in all this as well. Yeah, I like to be that was my higher consciousness. Isn't he the greatest guy ever? <laughs> well, I have a, um, a lot of ideas of um, incorporating yoga in a new way in helping mm. to facilitate the creative inner process of psychotherapy. So, and some of that we will do at the workshop um, uh, in Los Osos, as well as um, in October we'll be in Esalen and we'll be doing another workshop. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. I will be attending as well, and I love yoga, and uh, this seems to me to be just a very interesting way to incorporate some of the new activities that you were talking about. What are your hobbies and things that you like to do to, to generate this process? Maybe because we are so intensely busy at times, some of our favorite activities are hiking, walking, mm. especially contemplative walks. Mm. We might be climbing a local mountain, but we stop and we look at the view and we just look think we soak in the beauty. Mm -hmm. We allow our minds to just receive and we're curious, but are we receiving? So that's what's behind a lot of our personal activities. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for the creative process in the other as well as in ourselves. And that's the hourly and daily dharma of Darwin. I and it's say. also the understanding that, that um, when you go out and you do something different, when you read a, new, read a new book, when you study a new theory, when you go out and, and take an idea for a walk with you, or, you know, in my case, I like to kayak. So mm -hmm. I might take an idea with me and out in my kayak, and by the time I get back with all of this exercise, I have this blood flow going through my body where I'm really bright, I'm in a higher consciousness because I've been moving. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the greatest elements of, of exercise. We also live in nature, Bonnie. We're very, very fortunate that uh, Los Osos is on the southern end of Morro Bay. And uh, a block from our home begins the magnificent state park, Montaña de Oro, yeah. which goes for about 20 miles on the coast. And so we're constantly in nature, day in and day out. It's right outside of our window. Even now, as I'm speaking with you, if I avert my eyes, I can look at uh, uh, the bay of uh, uh, the estuary in, in Morro Bay and uh, just uh, incredible beauty. So we're inspired to get out into the beauty, and that's some of the art of each day, right. is being in the beauty of where we live. Right. Constantly a healing, self-healing process, just to appreciate that beauty, gentle exercise, and receptivity to what, what's happening right now. Right. And the beauty right. that we find in each other right. each day, that we've been together now for 20 years, and I think that we continually, it's, it's new each day. And uh, we're fascinated with that. Well, you're very lucky. You are certainly a lovely couple. And it's wonderful to see the two of you together and to see you pursuing your passions. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I personally feel really grateful for the opportunity to live during this time when we have access to new discoveries in neuroscience that are corroborating and validating a lot of the things that we have known for a long time about depth psychology, about consciousness. Uh, and, and then to see the two of you going about it in a way that is so present uh, with such awareness and, and being able to pass that on to others, it's truly a gift. And, and I'm grateful for the work that you're doing, both of you. Well, thank you, Bonnie, so much. You're a pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate the time, you guys, and uh, look forward to seeing you again very soon. Uh, again, the upcoming workshop, which will be in Los Osos, is on March 18th through the 20th. 
with Catherine and Ernest Rossi, and you can you can register for that at the Institute for Cultural Change org, or also uh, you can find information about that Ernie on on your website, which features both of you, and that's Ernest Rossi dot com, and uh, E R N E S T R O S S I in case people need that. And then Catherine, uh, you guys also have a Facebook page. Thank you, Bonnie, so much.